Everyone can okay, hear me okay? Great. All right, we'll talk about Gaussian processes for the next couple hours. So I wanted to start by saying that Gaussian processes are uh, a mathematical object with, um, with a great history in theory uh, and also has, uh, are, are something that's been used uh, to good effect in quite a number of applications. Uh, we're not going to focus on either of those two pieces specifically, but rather talk about the, the piece in the middle, which is, which is uh, uh, from, from a usability context, how as machine learners can we use Gaussian processes. So here's how we're going to go about introducing Gaussian processes. I want to start with talking about Gaussians in general, uh, both in words and in pictures. This is just going to be uh, sort of an easy introduction into this so we can, think about, we can think about what a Gaussian process actually is from an intuitive perspective. Then we'll go in and build out some of the equations. We'll talk about using Gaussian processes in a basic regression uh, setting. That'll, be, th that'll get us about through the first hour. And then we'll take, we'll, we'll, we'll take a quick break. And then we'll come back and we'll think about moving beyond the basics of Gaussian processes. So what, what kind of things can we change? Uh, we'll connect that to some of the different technologies and machine learning that we've seen. And that'll, that'll just about do it. All right, so what is a Gaussian as far as machine learning is concerned? This, this should tie into some of the uh, uh, notions of Bayesian inference that you've seen in, in the last couple days. So a Gaussian, a Gaussian distribution, is essentially a handy tool for Bayesian inference on real valued variables. So here's a, here's a, here's a specific example that we're going to talk about throughout the course of this. I'm interested in measuring my heart rate. So how, how might I do this from a modeling, modeling perspective? And, I'm, and I'm, here I'm going I'm to measure my heart rate at 7 a.m. And the fact that I do that index by time is going to be important, and we're going to see that in a moment. OK, so I'm a reasonably healthy guy. So you might think, OK, a priori, I have some belief about what my heart rate is going to be when I measure it at 7 a.m. Maybe it's somewhere between 50 and 60 beats per minute. So I put some Gaussian, uh, some Gaussian prior on that, and there's a density. Now I can go in on a particular morning and I can measure my heart rate. I measure it at 61. I can go in on a couple other days and I can measure that three, three more times. So now I've got these four observations, these four noisy observations that are measured on four different days is my heart rate. And what the Gaussian allows me to do and what the notion of Bayesian inference allows me to do is that I can then take my prior, this gray distribution, and those four draws from that Gaussian and I can do posterior inference. So I can come up with a posterior P of, this, of, of my underlying heart rate, given the noisy observations that you've seen. And you see that that's, again, a Gaussian. I now have more confidence about where that is. And I see that, in fact, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's centered around, say, 60, 62. OK. So let's take that univariate Gaussian case and move that up to multivariate Gaussian. So we talked about measuring my heart rate at 7 a.m. I could also want to measure my heart rate at 8 a.m. And let's think about how, uh, how those observations of not just a single real valued variable, but rather a pair of numbers at 7 and 8 a.m., how that would change. So to do that, we can't use the same univariate Gaussian. We want to move up to a multivariate Gaussian. This should be an object that we're all familiar with. Now, the multivariate Gaussian we're going to conventionally look at as these um, on a flat surface, these ellipsoids of, of uh, isoprobability. And so what is this distribution telling us? This distribution is telling us now we've got some prior belief, not on, on a single heart rate measurement, but on a pair of heart rate measurements. It shows that there's some positive correlation, which is to say if I measure, if, if, if I've got a higher heart rate at 7 a.m., I imagine it'll be higher at, at 8 a.m. And so then we can do the same thing. So here's our prior. I can go in and take four measurements on four different days. Now remember, these measurements now are a pair of numbers, 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. So I can get that data. I can use Bayes' rule in the same way. And I can come up with some posterior inference. And now I have, I have a refined belief of what, of what my heart rate is at 7 and 8 a.m. So now I'm going to take those two measurements, the, the measurement that happened at 7 and the measurement that happened at 8, and I'm going to represent that in a slightly different way. So this is the same data. I've got four, data, four, four pairs of numbers. This is the same data. I've just indexed it by time now. So you see that the, the, one, the one red point we were looking at before, which is the pair of numbers at 7 and 8 AM, is now, is now put there on that axis at 7 and 8 AM, four data points still. So then the natural thing you would want to do next 
is you want to say, okay, what if I measure at 9 a.m.? What if I measure what if I measure my heart rate at 10 a.m. and so on? So what this is getting at is if we wanted to measure at 7 and 8 a.m., we used a bivariate Gaussian. We want to do that again at 9 a.m., maybe we would use a three-dimensional Gaussian, a four-dimensional Gaussian, a five-dimensional Gaussian. When really what we're getting at, what we care about, or, or what we might be interested in, is inferring that entire function over time. And that, that's how we get to a Gaussian process intuitively. So rather than having some finite set of Gaussians that we have to measure strictly from, we have, if you will, uh, an infinite set of Gaussians, and that's, that's what a function is. So here's how we're going to represent that throughout, uh, throughout the course of this. So each of, these, each of these function curves in color is going to be a single draw from a Gaussian process. That's a function. The way we're going to represent the, way we're going to represent the prior distribution is with this, this mean, which is this gray line here, and this envelope that sits around it, which is two standard deviations around it. So what this is saying is that we imagine that our average draw is going to be something like that, and we have some, some distribution that wiggles around that inside that envelope. What this allows us to do, and this is, this, is, this is really one of the key features of a Gaussian process, is that remember before we were talking about measuring rigidly at those hourly times. But now if we've got this nice infinite dimensional object, we can measure really at any time we want. And we'll get into all the mathematical reasons uh, for, for why we're able to do this. So I can measure at this particular time. And you can see what's happened is that I've measured a data point at about 1030. And what that's done is that's taken my prior in the same way that we did in, in, uh, in that fixed dimensional case. That's taken my prior and it said actu it's refined it into a posterior. And it says, actually, I believe that my function is not quite flat anymore, but rather is closer to that data point. And you can see that around the data point that I've measured, I now have, I now have increased confidence. We can then take another measurement, more measurements still, and you see what's happening as we go through this process. As we get more and more data, we're scribing out this regression function, this nice smooth underlying function, and we're getting more and more confident about the envelope around it. OK, so that, that intuitive summary is, is, as, is as follows. When we were taking, when we were taking measurements, uh, single measurements at 7 AM, we were getting real valued variables. So was, the univariate Gaussian was a nice distribution over real valued variables. When we moved that to pairs or triplets or what have you, that the multivariate Gaussian allowed us to do that. And now when we want infinite numbers of real valued variables, in other words, functions of real valued variables, that's what a Gaussian process allows us to do. So, so if you take nothing else away from, from this lecture, take, take that away, that this is something that allows us, that the Gaussian process is effectively something that allows us to have a Gaussian distribution over infinite numbers of variables. And what that drives us to is this notion of regression. So let's look at regression real quick and talk about a few reminders of what regression does for us. So I'll put this up again. So here we've got all these blue data points that we've, that we've observed. And we believe that there's some smooth underlying function that is really what the description of, 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 of what the data is doing. So one of, the th one of the things that regression is quite good for is just that, which is denoising and smoothing. So we, want, we don't want to follow every little wiggle of these data points, but rather, but rather come up with some uh, good description of, 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 of what is noise and what is true signal. We also want to do prediction and forecasting. So I've collected all this data. That's great. But now I want to know what my heart rate might be a couple minutes after 9 in the morning. Well, to do that, you can, you can then have some, some query at that time. And you can say, OK, I believe that my heart rate should be centered, centered at this point with some, uh, with, with some variance envelope. Furthermore, uh, one, of the, one of the things about regression, and, and, and this uh, you, you've, you've, heard, you've heard a bit from, from, from Peter about, and we'll hear, we'll hear more, is, is the, the dangers of parametric models. So what I've done here is I've taken this data and I've fit a quadratic to it. So you can see, OK, this quadratic has a reasonably good reasonably good fit to the data, but it seems to miss some of the features. And that, of course, is because it's a fixed parametric model, and, and it, can't, it, it can't respond to a lot of these features. Uh, furthermore, the parametric models get us into some dangerous places. Like, because of, this, because of the way this data was fit, there seems to be some 
magical point around 11 a.m. where my heart rate peaks for the day, and, and then it sort of falls off after that. And furthermore, if you, if, if you really take this too seriously and you, and you extrapolate from this, this has my heart stopping around, around dinner time. So, so there's, there's, a, there's, there's some dangers to parametric models. Um, furthermore, overfitting, underfitting is always going to be a concern with regression, and we'll talk about how Gaussian process deal ni nicely with that. So he, you can see here, we've got this model that is, uh, that is overfit. In other words, it's chasing all the little wiggles, all the little noise in the data. Conversely, you can have a data that's, uh, you can have a model that's underfit. And so you see here, uh, we're, still, we're still fitting the data, so to speak, but we seem to have missed a lot of the interesting structure. All right. So that is, uh, that's, that's basically what I, what I wanted to go through in, 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 in this first section of Gaussians in words and pictures. So now we're, gonna, now we're gonna fill that intuition in with some equations. I should say, please interrupt me throughout the course of this if you have questions about this. I suppose everyone's been doing that. Okay, the multivariate Gaussian. This, 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 this should be a review, I hope. Uh, we say that F, which is a, uh, an n vector, is normally distributed if it has the following distribution. And that following distribution is parameterized by some mean vector m, which is, which is an arbitrary n vector, and some covariance matrix k. And the only constraint on that covariance matrix is that it's positive semi-definite. The shorthand that we'll use throughout this is we say that f is distributed normal with mean m and covariance k. So as we said before, the loose definition of what a Gaussian process is is a multivariate Gaussian of an uncountably infinite length. In other words, take that multivariate Gaussian vector and just make it longer and longer and longer. And what does that get to? That gets to a function. That, that, that's a very loose definition indeed. Here's a slightly more rigorous definition. We say that F is a Gaussian process if for any subset index, any set of indexes T, if F of T, which is, which, is, which is the function f evaluated at, the, at those index points, has a multivariate distribution according to normal m of t and k of t. All right, so I'll say that I'm using t here uh, as real numbers for familiarity with regression in time, but the domain can be, uh, can be any, dimension, uh, any dimension x in, uh, in rd, and we'll, we'll show an example of that later. All right, so I kind of breezed by this, this fact uh, in, in this definition. What are those functions m and what are those functions k? So let's talk about that now because that's, that's an interesting part of what, what, a, what makes a Gaussian process. So the mean function, by analogy to that mean vector in the multivariate Gaussian case where we said the mean vector can be just about anything, the mean function can be, uh, can be any function that maps index points t onto real values. Um, Often in, Gaussian, in the Gaussian process literature, uh, because you can mean subtract your data uh, and, and because it makes notation easier, we'll just, we'll just um, set, set the mean function to zero. Because really, in the modeling context, what, what, what often makes things most interesting is modeling that kernel or covariance function. So that, that covariance function is, 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 is again a function that maps your input space onto a real value except it takes a pair of arguments. So it's any valid Mercer kernel. So this connects to all the stuff that you've talked about uh, in, in kernels already. And what this is, is just any function, any function that has two arguments, and that function has to be a positive semi-definite, uh, a positive semi-definite function. In other words, it needs, to, it needs to obey Mercer's theorem. Now Mercer's theorem, again, uh, is a very rich mathematical uh, uh, theorem from functional analysis. But when it's whittled down to, to what we care about in this particular case, what it says is if you give any finite or any, any, uh, any subset index of t and you evaluate that function into a matrix KTT, in other words, take all your time points, evaluate it, and build it into this n by n matrix, that that matrix K will be positive semi-definite. So to summarize that, the GP is fully defined by a mean function and a kernel function, and this requirement that every finite subset of the domain has this multivariate normal distribution, uh, this consistent multivariate normal distribution, f according to m evaluate, uh, the mean function evaluated at those points t, and the kernel function evaluated at those points t. Uh, 
So a couple notes. Um, one, this is something that we can conceptualize pretty easily and say, okay, I've got these two functions, the mean and, and the kernel function, and I can evaluate that, and that will give me, that'll give me a mean and covariance matrix. Great. And I can stipulate that I want, that I, that I want those to always be this, um, uh, to define this Gaussian. But the fact that that should exist as a, as a valid mathematical object is, is not at all trivial. And, and furthermore, the fact that this is a full specification for it, in other words, that you give me, a, you give me one M and one K, and that defines uniquely a Gaussian process, is, is, is not at all trivial. Um, one of the things that's also not trivial and is quite nice is that most of the interesting properties that we're used to in, uh, in dealing with Gaussian variables, and we'll get into those uh, in a moment, that those are all inherited. Okay, so this kernel function is the only, is, is the only really interesting thing that, 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 that doesn't sort of slot in uh, seamlessly into what we were talking about with Gaussian. So, so let's, let's unpack that a bit more. So the canonical example for a kernel function is, is probably the squared exponential kernel. So uh, I know that looks like a Gaussian, but ignore that for the time being. Just consider that, just consider that a kernel function of two arguments. So what I want to do, just to, just to make a very, uh, uh, a very explicit connection between a kernel function and a covariance matrix, is evaluate, evaluate this kernel function at a handful of points. So to do that, we're going to choose some hyperparameters. So you'll notice that I've slipped, in, I've slipped in a couple new parameters here. We call these hyperparameters because they live, they live in the kernel. I guess I'll use the clicker here. So we've got two, we've got two hyperparameters here. We've got L, the characteristic, characteristic length scale, and we've got sigma squared F, which is the, which is the variance or the power of, the, of this kernel. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna, we're just gonna evaluate this. So let's say I take three index points in T. That's 7 a.m., 8 a.m., and 10.30. These are the three measurement times that we care about. Now what are we asking? We're asking, what is, what's, what's, the, what's the correlation, what's the covariance between, between random variables, between my heart rate variable at these times? So how do I go about doing that? Okay, I take this function here, I take these pairs of points, I evaluate it at all pairs, and I build this into a matrix. <coughs> so what we can then do is we can then change these kernel hyperparameters and see how this covariance matrix changes. So what I've done here, I'll just flash back in between that. We had a length scale of 100. Now we're gonna go to a length scale of 500. And what we see <coughs> is that the diagonal, we've still got the same values, but what's happening is as we move away from the diagonal, the correlation is falling off much less quickly. So what's this saying? With a higher length scale value, between 7 and 8 a.m., these variables are highly, highly correlated. As you get further away to 1030, this variable is not quite as correlated, but still, it's still quite highly correlated. On the other hand, if we make this a smaller number, you see that the correlation drops off very quickly. So this is nearly a scaled identity matrix. In other words, in other words um, my heart rate at 7 a.m. is nearly independent from my heart rate at 8 a.m. Uh, we can also change sigma f and see how that changes things. So this, um, remember we were putting up that, that, that envelope around, around the Gaussian mean, in, around the GP mean, that gray envelope. So what we're doing here is changing that. So we double that, the envelope doubles, okay? So that was just to tie in uh, something, something where a lot of people when they're learning Gaussian processes get tripped up is connecting the kernel function to, to covariance matrices. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat that a couple times, but I think, uh, but, but I think it's, it's valuable to make that connection. All right, so an intuitive summary of GP so far. Uh, GP offer distributions over, over functions. And for any finite subset vector, uh, we, we've got this normal distribution. And you see here, as promised, I've dropped, I've dropped the mean function. And the covariance, the covariance matrix K is calculated by just plugging the T, the index points, into this kernel function. So to so introduce some new notation, before we were saying F is normally distributed uh, with, with mean zero and covariance K, uh, 
you'll often see written F is distributed as a GP uh, with mean function M and covariance function K. All right, so I mentioned that I mentioned that most of the important Gaussian properties uh, that we care about are inherited by, uh, by Gaussian processes. And so what I want to do is walk through a couple of properties of the Gaussian that are, that are going to be interesting for today's purposes, that are very useful to, in the GP context. So one is, uh, is additivity. In other words, adding two Gaussians together gives you a Gaussian again. That'll, that'll be nice to us in forming a joint. Uh, conditioning. So conditioning on Gaussian random variables, uh, this, this, is, this is important for inference. Uh, the ability to calculate expectations, which is going to be interesting for uh, calculating posterior and predictive moments. And finally, our ability to marginalize out variables that we don't care about. So there, there, are, many other there are many other nice properties of the Gaussian, of course, but, but those are the ones that we, wanna, that we really want to care about today. So let's first talk about uh, forming a, joint, a jointly Gaussian distribution. So uh, I've got some prior, I've got some prior on F. So F I'm going to use throughout as, 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 our, as our prior. Um, I've got some Gaussian prior with MF and covariance KFF. I've got some IID noise that I add to that, N. And then I want to let Y equal F plus N. So what's this saying? This is saying the underlying function that I care about the underlying uh, regressor that I care about is F, and I measure some noisy data observations of that Y, which is Y plus this independent noise N. So what's nice about this is that this allows us then to form a joint distribution, P of Y and F, and you see that this is again a Gaussian. So a couple objects that we haven't seen before, so KFF we gave to you, MFF we gave to you, and so you say, okay, what's What's KFY and what's KYY? Okay, you can just evaluate that out. KFY is this expectation, and in this case, that equals KFF. KYY, in this case, equals KFF plus the noise. So the nice, thing, the, the, the nice feature now that we have to connect this back to the regression problem is that the latent F, which we care about, and the noisy observation Y are jointly Gaussian. Okay, but wait a second. We just did this all with regular multivariate Gaussians. So where did where did where did the GP go? Because we've been, we've just been talking about GP. So the point I want to make here is that if f and y are indexed by some some input points t, in other words, if if mf is actually just some mean function evaluated at these at these n points t, these n index points, and kff is is is, a, is some kernel evaluation then I could have just as easily written this as a GP prior F and, some added, and an additive noise GP N and use this same additivity property. But here, when I wrote this, this, this specific Gaussian, I would have just indexed this Y at T and indexed this F at T. So this is, this is you're starting to see one of the really nice features of, of, of the GP is that, is that all we need to do is bring in a finite set of, of index points and then we're working with multivariate Gaussians. So, so as, as a warning, because of this, is that there is some overloaded notation here. So F, uh, will, people, people are, are, are generally pretty loose about uh, that notation. It can either be infinite, uh, in other words, a GP. Here I write F is GP, so now F is this infinite dimensional object, or a finite multivariate Gaussian. Uh, and that, 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 that can, that's generally put pretty clear depending on the context. All right, the next property that we care about is uh, conditioning or doing, ba uh, doing Bayesian inference. <coughs> so here we've got our latent F and our noisy observation Y, and we know that those are jointly Gaussian. And we've got uh, F and Y are distributed according to this distribution. So then we can do inference, and we can say that the posterior of F given Y is again a normal distribution. So this is, this, is, this is an important fact of Gaussian distributions. And this is just um, a, a <coughs> stock and trade manipulation of a Gaussian distribution. This is um, actually proving that this is, that this is the case is, is something that I think that everybody should do once and only once. Um, once, once you've done it, just, just, just forget about it because it's, it's rather tedious. Um, but, but it's a cool fact to know. 
So a couple things to point out here. You see that we've got this mean function, uh, sorry, this, uh, this mean and this covariance. We can unpack this a little bit. We should all be pretty familiar with this. One interesting thing here is that you see that this is just a linear function of our observations y. So that's, that's nice to know. And further, uh, this term here, KFF is our, prior, is our prior covariance. So that's the uncertainty that we had about that latent. And you see that we've subtracted here this other term. And that's essentially how much our data explains about what we know about, about our prior. So if our data tells us nothing about our prior uncertainty, then this will be a very small term. And, and in other words, our uncertainty is still just around KFF. If instead our data tells us a whole bunch, then this, get, this approaches KFF and our uncertainty decreases considerably. So the main point of this, and, and you, can, you can not worry about parsing this too much, but rather inference of the latent given the data is simple linear algebra. So we've reduced all of, all of the complexity of Bayesian inference and all, all, all the problems that are sometimes associated that associated with that to a, simple, to a simple set of linear equations. All right, the next feature, so we talked about forming a joint, we talked about uh, doing inference, so now we can talk about uh, um, calculating expectations. So again, this, this simple term, uh, this simple conditioning term gave us this fact, and what this allows us to see is that, I mean, this is, this is repetitive, I suppose, but the expectation the expectation of f given y is simply this mean term. And so that's, what is that? That's the map estimate, that's the posterior mean. Um, there are a number of other moments that we'd be interested in. One, one other thing that I wanted to bring up, so we looked at the posterior moments. f and y, we've been talking about this, this joint Gaussianity between the latent f and, and, and the noisy observation y. Uh, instead, we can, look at, we can look at y, which is data that we've collected and y star, which is data that we haven't collected. In other words, uh, uh, when, when I said I want to query on and, and see what my heart rate's going to be at nine, a couple minutes after 9 AM, uh, this is convention in, in, in the literature that y, y star is, 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 a, is data that you want to predict. So those are also jointly Gaussian. And so that's no different. We just use the same, we just use the same conditioning property to get to, to get to this fact. And you can see that this, is our predictive, predictive mean. <coughs> the final property that I, want to, that I want to explore is marginalization. So again, we have these jointly Gaussian variables. We can marginalize out the latent, because you say, maybe I, don't care about the, maybe I don't care about the latent function at all. I just want to know how well this Gaussian process model describes my data. So to do that, you just P of Y, you integrate out f, and uh, another, another nice property of Gaussians is that you can just read that right off of here, that y is distributed my with covariance kyy. So th this is nice because it gives us the, the, the data log likelihood, which then can be useful for uh, model selection, model comparison, and things like this. Oh, right, so one, one, one note, because we'll come back to this. Um, you, you notice here that when, when I introduced those hyperparameters that, that lived up in the kernel, um, those have been suppressed here, but actually the, the, the data is P of Y given those, those uh, kernel hyperparameters, and this, this will be the basis of model selection because we'll want to tune our, our, our data marginal likelihood based on what those hyperparameter setting, settings are. Okay, so at this point, how we do it on time? Okay, at this point you might be complaining because, because you might say, okay, I, I'm bored. All, all we've done so far is, is, is messed around with Gaussians and I'm familiar with Gaussians and I, you know, I thought, thought we were coming to talk about infinite dimensional uh, probability distributions and, and, and interesting stuff. And so if that's your complaint, you're, you're, you're correct and I'm, and I'm sorry about that. But, but in fact, this is the whole point, right? The whole point of this is that we take this, this beautiful mathematical theory and when it comes down to actually dealing with these objects, it's simple linear algebra, it's, it's, it's simple inference on Gaussian distributions and all this. And so what I want to convince you of is that even with that sort of banal setup, we can do some, some really quite remarkable things. Okay, so 
Now let's look at some of the remarkable things, I suppose, that, 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 that GP can do. We've talked about Gaussians and words and pictures. We've talked about some of the equations. So let's talk about using, using GPs in a regression context. So our example model, which we've introduced throughout the course of the equations section, and now we'll, now we'll see what it can do. So say the F is our, is our latent. It's a GP uh, with zero mean and some, and some kernel KFF. And the kernel has this form. This is the squared exponential. When we get to talking about, talking about kernels, we'll, we'll, we'll mess with that. Uh, but for now, just, just, just let that be. We say that y given f, this is our noise term, right? In other words, I've, if, I give you, if I give you the latent function value f, the data that I observe is, is distributed some, with some independent noise on top of that. That's got some kernel. Uh, that's a cor that's, this, is the, this is the white noise kernel. And that all this is saying is that two different, um, is that two different, the noise that I observe, the measurement noise that I observe on two different time points is independent. What this allows us to do, again, because of this additivity property, is we can, we can add this and see, again, that y is distributed as a GP with some kernel KYY. And you see that these <coughs> kernel functions add. So all right, so now we've got the probabilistic model, the distribution fully specified. So let's just fill that in with some of these hyperparameters. So I'm going to choose sigma f equals 10. So that's the standard deviation envelope. Uh, I'm going to choose a characteristic length scale of 50 and uh, a, noise, a noise power of 1. So all right, so let's, let's, let's look at, again, of our, our visual representation of that. So this is the prior on f. What this is saying to connect this to the equations is that we've got a mean function of 0. So that mean continues along at 0 all the, at all times. And we've got uh, sigma, squared, sigma f of 10. And so this is the two standard deviation envelope. So now we can go ahead and we can take draws from this Gaussian process. So this is a single draw from that prior f, the GP. And so now you see, hopefully connected to this notion of, of how we can draw a function from, uh, uh, from a GP. So the steps of this should be clear. This is the only, this is the only code snippet I will give you throughout the course of it, but it's, but it's, but it's, only, it's only one line, and, and, and Delon will, will unpack that more. Um, OK, so how do, I get, how do I actually get this draw? So to do that, I take a whole bunch of index points, a finite number. So here I took the, the integer index points between 0 and 500. I evaluate that kernel function just like we did with those three index points. I evaluate the kernel function and build that into some, in, into some uh, 500 by 500 matrix, KFF. And then I can take a draw from a Gaussian with zero mean and this covariance. So how that's actually done, right, and this, this would be your, your MATLAB code, um, how that's actually done is, is according to this. So that will give you, this, this procedure will give you this nice, will give you this nice draw. OK, so there was one draw in green. Now we've taken four draws of that. And, and I, I'm belaboring this point just so, that, just so that we remind ourselves that a draw from a Gaussian process gives you a function. So four draws from that will give you these nice four functions. Um, before, when we were evaluating the kernel matrix, we, we messed around with the hyperparameters a little bit to see how that changed, uh, to see how that changed the covariance matrix. Let's do that here in pictures. So here is sigma f of 10 and the length scale of 50. If I change, I'm going to leave that length scale at 50, but now I've changed the power of that, the envelope of that, from 10 down to 4. And you see what's happened is that the, 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 um, the envelope has shrunk and the draws have shrunk. Not surprising. If I, change, if I change the length scale of 50 to a length scale of 10, right? so that what this is saying is as two points get further apart, they fall off. The, the, their, their correlation falls off more quickly. So accordingly, you get more wiggly draws. Uh, one final point on this is this, this should feel a whole lot like when we were evaluating those, uh, those covariance matrices. In other words, this is, a, is, a, uh, is, a, is, a, is a closer to the identity matrix, the covariance matrix, is closer to the identity matrix than, for example, this, which has much longer range correlations.
Okay, so I mentioned that uh, we've been looking at regression in time and taking draws uh, that are nice temporal functions. Those are easy to look at and, and familiar to us. Uh, you can also have multidimensional input. So um, one of, the, one of the, the, the histories of the application areas where Gaussian processes have been used a lot is in geostatistics, and they're, um, they're often interested in, 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 in spatial Gaussian processes. So for example, latitude and longitude. Instead of regression in time, you want to regress on latitude and longitude. So to do that, we can make uh, we can make each input uh, instead of instead of a single real uh, a real valued number a pair of numbers. Um, so now we've got some Gaussian process here. F is the same GP, and the kernel is almost exactly the same, except here there's just an extra term. Uh, there's 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 a there's a squared term for each dimension of that Gaussian process. So what might a draw from that look like? Instead of one single function, uh, what you get now is a field over, over uh, latitude and longitude. So this is your random function that's drawn over that field. So um, I suppose, shameless plug, if you are staying for AI stats and you want to see a, a, a multi-dimensional GP in action, um, um, we've, got a, we've got a paper on that. And, and, I'm, and I'm sure there will be other papers uh, with GPs as well. OK. so. Um, We've got the same model that we've just been dealing with, and now let's let's gather some data. So this is the, this is this is our model, the GP model. We've got our prior, and we can go in and take we can go in and take a data point. So I want so let's say I gather a data point at time two two hundred and four. So what I know is that I can evaluate y of two hundred and four. And I know that this is, according to the model, this is Gaussian distributed according to mean zero and KYY evaluated at 204, 204. That's a simple univariate Gaussian. This is all just pulling this right out of, right out of the definition of, 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 of the GPY. And I'm just evaluating the kernel matrix. So then we can use conditioning to update the posterior. So here I've still got the prior P of F. But now I've got this data observation, so I can, use, I can use the inference rule that we talked about and evaluate y to, uh, sorry, take this data point y at 204 and run this through the equation. And what does this give me? Well, now this has refined my posterior estimate of f. So this is no longer a flat mean function, but I think the mean function comes down here and goes through f. And furthermore, because of our choice, of, of noise parameters, you can see that what's happened here is right around 204, I'm awfully sure my, 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 my uh, covariance envelope has collapsed, and I'm awfully sure that, that the measurement is around there. But as soon as I get further away, well, I forget, because, because I don't think that what happens at 400 is particularly related to what happens at 204. So by the time I get over here, I'm basically back to the prior. So a small change is that here we were looking at the posterior. This, this I think is important, is important to hang on just for a second because often when you look at um, GP work, it's not clear whether people are talking about whether, whether they're showing the, the posterior or, the, or they're showing a predictive model. So this is on the posterior. And this here is the predictive, the predictive distribution. So you'll just notice there's a very small change here, but this, this, this variance envelope has just increased slight, ever so slightly because we think that on top of that, on top of that posterior is, is actually some measurement noise. So this, this, this is our uh, belief about the predictive distribution. OK, so then I had, I had point 204. Let's say I also gather uh, an, another data point at 90. Well, then I can add that in the same way to this distribution. So, And you see what's happened here is I've added this data point at 90. And the same thing has happened. The, the variance envelope has decreased. The mean function has changed. I can do this and add more and more data points as I go. And this is what we've got to. And this is, again, the predictive, uh, this is again the predictive distribution. It's Gaussian. And all I'm doing is, is, is adding more and more. more I'm, I'm, I'm making this vector here what I've observed longer and longer. OK, so this gets us to, this gets us to a question, which is, all right, so I get more and more data, but when am I getting to my actual regression function? Because I can see that we're doing regression here, but when am I going to produce the parameters of my model? Right? But of course, this is a, a non-parametric regression model. 
So this is one of the virtues of, of Gaussian processes is that we're not gonna just spit out a couple, a couple parameters of a quadratic function, but rather as we, as we gather all our data, the GP regression gets more and more refined. So this is one of the benefits of GP regression, which is it lets, it lets the data speak for itself. Uh, I suppose the downside of that is that all the, data, all the data must speak. So you see that as this Y grows and we collect more and more data, uh, we're, doing, we're doing a larger and larger problem here with in, uh, inverting KYY, um, doing this, 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 this nice piece of simple linear algebra. So you'll often hear, you'll often hear this, this comment, which is non-parametric models have an infinite number of, of, of parameters. And I'd like to refine this slightly in, in, in our minds, the way we think about this, and not say that non-parametric models have an infinite number of parameters, but rather non-parametric models have a finite but unbounded number of parameters. And that, and that number of parameters grows with the data. So uh, the way you can think about it here is that um, as, as this gets larger and larger, and tends towards infinite, yes, we have, we have an unbounded number of, of, of parameters that can describe what our prediction is going to be, but that's still just growing finitely with, with the amount of data that we get. Okay. So we are almost, we're almost through the basics. Um, there's one more piece of, of, of the basics in Gaussian processes and using Gaussian processes for regression that I want to talk about. And that is model selection or hyperparameter learning. So all throughout the course of this, uh, we've been adding these data points, looking at the predictive distribution, looking at posterior inference. Um, <coughs> and we've been doing this with a fixed, uh, with a fixed model, uh, F, this Gaussian process with KFF, according to this function. So I want to talk about these hyperparameters now, L and sigma squared F. So here we've got L e equals 50, and we've seen how changing that uh, can change the fit that we get. So if I make L quite a bit smaller, you can see that now L is, uh, sorry, that, that this GP is overfitting the data. In other words, it's chasing, it's chasing each individual wiggle of these, of these data points. It's recurring, uh, it's forgetting very quickly, probably too quickly, such that really it says here that we know effectively nothing about, about uh, about, our, about our inference on this data point, when in fact, given this is probably a better description, we believe that the function should be around here. Uh, again, if we have a length scale that's too high, then we're underfitting the data. So here we've got some very confident prediction, but it's probably missing some of the interesting structure that exists in this data. So the question that we want to talk about right now and what, what we want to address is how can we, how can we tune or integrate over these hyperparameters L and sigma squared F so that we get, so that we take our data and we get to this model, which is just right. So there's two popular ways to do that. Um, the first of which is to use the marginal likelihood. So we talked about the marginalization properties of the Gaussian, which is to say that we can marginalize out, we can marginalize out the latent function F and we can just look at the marginal likelihood of the data y. Um, and again, I said that this is actually hiding these extra parameters, which are now the parameters that we care about, these hyperparameters. We want to do model selection on these hyperparameters. So just looking at this, and particularly when you talk to people that are outside of Bayesian machine learning, um, it's, 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 it's quite common that people say, it's not obvious why this, this, this should this should do model selection uh, automatically and that this shouldn't overfit or underfit the data. But it's, it's, it's right in the math. So let's, let's unpack that for a moment. So here is the uh, log marginal likelihood of the data. And you can see that this has three terms. Okay, let's ignore this one. This is just a normalizing constant. So what do these two, what do these two terms do? This term typically is called the data fit term and this term is often called a complexity penalty. So what you can see here is that if we just consider sigma f, right, so that's the envelope, that's the envelope of the Gaussian process. So as sigma f gets larger, this will fit the data better. In other words, more data gets, more data gets inside that, uh, th that envelope. 
But as that happens, as sigma f gets larger, this term also scales up, so you pay a penalty here. So these two terms, these two terms, your complexity and your data fit are at odds with one another. And that gives you this, uh, this, this, this automatic determination of overfitting versus underfitting, which happens in a Bayesian model. Uh, unpacking this for the length scale uh, is, is, is just a little bit trickier, but again, it's simple linear algebra and comes to the volume of this, uh, uh, the volume of this ellipsoid, which gets larger, uh, this gets larger as you get closer to, to white. In other words, as you get a shorter, shorter length scale. Um, and, and that opposes in the data fit term as well. So that, that's, um, that's worth spending some time unpacking on your own. This is why you'll hear the term uh, Bayesian Occam's razor, or, or Occam's razor is, is implemented uh, via this regularization or this Bayesian model selection because there is this, um, you've got this data fit term here and you've got this automatic regularizer here which, which discourages over complex models. So uh, the details of this dealing with model selection uh, will, be, will be fleshed out some in the practical. Uh, another way to do this, and this, this, falls outside of the, uh, this falls outside of the Bayesian context, I suppose, but one can also use uh, a cross-validation uh, cross approach, uh, which is quite popular in machine learning. So instead of considering the marginal likelihood, we can consider the predictive, predictive distribution for some held out data. So here I'll call this the predictive log likelihood. So here I've, I've, I'll, hold out some, I'll hold out some test data, and as we know, this is again a Gaussian, P of Y test given Y train. So it's again a Gaussian, so you can use this, uh, you can take derivatives on this, and you can tune mo uh, uh, model hyperparameters in the same way that you do in any cross-validation approach. Uh, and again, that, that'll be, uh, model selection will be dealt with in the practical. All right, so, that gets through the basics of what I want to talk about with uh, GPs and words and pictures, GPs and equations, and then using GPs in a basic regression context. Um, we're just, just a few minutes ahead of time, so uh, why don't we take a few questions? Nice, Koa. Uh, uh. So when would you want to use each of those two methods? Like, uh, I mean, it, it seems to me wouldn't it always be better to use the first one? Like, Uh, so I suppose I suppose choosing choosing uh, Bayesian model selection versus cross validation is something that uh, uh, people can do for for a lot of reasons. Some of which is 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 just the uh, just their the, their opinion on on this divide between between uh, between Bayesian and, and frequentist statistics. I think one reason why a lot of times people use cross validation measures is for out of model data. So one thing that this um, one thing that this marginal likelihood uh, measure is very much within is very much within the model that you've chosen, whereas cross validation you, you're, you're saying let me let me ignore the model so to speak, and I'm really just interested in uh, in the predictive ability of that on 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 held out data. Um, so that's 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 one distinction. Uh, that that's that's one distinction I think. Yeah, so um, we will get to that in kernel, in kernel choices. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about a, a, periodic, a, a periodic function exactly, yeah. So, so that, that, that kernel that we've chosen, the squared exponential kernel, is, 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 is just a nice and canonical choice that gives you smooth functions over time. Um, we, can, we, we, we can and will mess with that as, as, soon, as, as soon as we go to the next section. Uh, if there are no other questions, why don't we take why don't we take a five minute five minute breather, and then we'll 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 come back and we'll we'll get into some some more interesting details. <laughs> <laughs>